Today I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to take a, a look at one verse as the primary text. It's 1 Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonians 5.11. And it goes like this. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just uh, as you also are doing. So he's commending them. I mean, you are already comforting each other and edifying each other. I want you to keep on doing that. Don't ever stop doing that. Now, the word to comfort is the word parakaleo, which is the Greek word that is sometimes translated to encourage. So it's comfort, it's encourage, it's come alongside, it's to help. And so we are instructed to encourage the people around us. This week, you will interact with many different people in many different circles, and you will leave a wake behind you. It will either be a positive moment or a negative moment. You will either encourage, exhort, edify, build up, or you will diminish or crush or make someone feel like they don't matter, that they're invisible and they have no value. And every conversation and every interaction that you have is going to do one of those two things. And we are told, we are called to make it a point that we should always remember to encourage. Always remember to encourage. Don't forget to encourage. So important. Last week, I wasn't here. If you were here, you noticed that, hopefully. Uh, thank God for Tom, who at the last minute jumped in and preached a great message on forgiveness. If you haven't heard it, you need to go listen to it. Um, I read it in the hospital. Um, as, as many of you know, my, my father, who is 84 years old, um, had open heart surgery last week. And um, I hated that. Uh, I saw the symptoms. I went with him to the doctor's appointment. I thought, oh no. Can an 84-year-old man endure uh, open heart surgery? I just endured it myself the year before. I told my dad, dad, we got to figure out a different way to bond as father and son. I mean, this is just way too hard. I hate fishing, but maybe we should take that up uh, because that's easier than this. So, you know, I, I watched him go through the surgery. The, uh, this time I'm in the waiting room. And thank God for the people that came around and were there. And, and then he went to ICU. And then last Saturday night, uh, I was there about 8 o'clock for the final hour of visiting. And um, my dad, all of a sudden, went into what they call AFib. I don't want to get too medical on you because I'm not going to say it right if I do. But and then his heart raced, just started racing. All the bells are going off in ICU. I mean, they don't, those things don't go off. I mean, they ding, 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 ding. I mean, it was like 45 minutes. It's driving me crazy. I'm, the, the, the nurse immediately asked my, my niece, Chanel, and I, if we would please step out of the room because they said he doesn't need any more stimulation. So I guess, you know, we, we stepped out. And then they started doing their work. And uh, Chanel and I just stood there in the hallway. And honestly, we, we're just like scared. What's going to happen? Is he going to be okay? Oh, Lord, please let him survive. Uh, his heart rate's so high. Don't let one of those new... Um, bypass veins blow out or anything like that. I mean, I, I just have all kinds of crazy imaginations. I don't know if you do in times like that, but uh, and, and, and so I, I, I told the, the nurse, I said, listen, we're going to just sit out here in the waiting room, but I'm not going home till you tell me if he's going to be okay. I'm going to stay here. So finally, after about, you know, another, I don't know, it was probably, probably an hour and a half, and the nurse came out and said, okay, we've got him under control. You can go back in and say good night. But I, we, we think it's okay. So I went home. And I'm like scared because it's like, it's like I love my dad. I don't want him to die. I know it's going to happen one day. I get it. I get it. And so I, I remember the next morning I woke up and I called Kyle. Kyle, I don't know what time I can be at church. Um, Tom's going to preach. And then Kyle, you know, I, I love people around me who speak sense. Um, he says, Pastor, just don't even come. Yeah, that's the better idea. I'm just going to go to the hospital where I need to be. And so I went to the hospital, and he was okay. But that morning, I just woke up with a troubled feeling. 
just a normal concern anybody would have. And I went through my daily routine, and I, I, I came across a verse that was actually provided for me through the Bible app. If you don't have that, you need to get it. And you can have your own regular reading plan, but sometimes it's nice to have someone throw something at you. And, and it just so happened, I don't believe that for anything, this is the verse that came up. Here, I'm so troubled, scared. It comes from Zephaniah 317. And it goes like this. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. He will, with his love, he will calm your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. And I sent my kids a text. I said, well, Grandpa's kind of like going through a rough time, but here's the verse I got for today. And then I just said to them, okay, God is with us. He will save. That's what, he's in the saving business. Isn't that awesome? And he's mighty to save. He has all the power in the world and can exceed natural things and do miracles if he, if he wills and it's necessary. Uh, he, he, he's, he will save. But then he delights in us and rejoices over us with song. So I said to my kids, we are okay and safe in God's presence because he is saving, loving, rejoicing. I love you all. Have a good day. And then I went off to the hospital. But you know what happened for me? God encouraged me. I felt it. I was stronger. I had more courage. He's going to calm our fears. That's so good. And he's going to rejoice over us with song. I think one of the most amazing things about God is that he likes us. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes I'm not sure I deserve to be liked by God. Because, like, I know me. I know my history. I know my failures. I know my struggles. And then I come across this verse. And it reminds me, and it should remind you today, God likes you. I want you to turn to the person beside you and just say to them, turns out, God likes you. Come on, you need a reminder. Okay, that was great. Okay, let's come back now. Man, you guys really, you, you're good at that. You're practicing the message already. Uh, one of my favorite parts of that is that he he rejoices over us with song. You know, uh, my, I have my, my youngest son, James, is, uh, he's not here this morning. But he, he's, he's got Down syndrome, and he's, he's like, honestly, one of my favorite people in the world. And I go with him to the gym. I go with him here and there. And when he's in my car, he thinks he owns my radio, and it's so annoying because I'm like, I'm changing the channel because I don't like what he chose. And he gets mad at me, and I remind him, hey, bud, if this is my car, is, did your dad ever do that to you? Well, James doesn't take that. He's, he's still going to manage the, the radio. We've got this great selection of stations, some of which I, I change the channel because there's one there that sometimes doesn't have all the best things to say, if you know what I'm saying. And so... Uh, <laughs> but I just can't tell you. I, I just love that guy. I actually do often burst into song, and I just, I just take his name, and I sing his song to him, whatever song. Sometimes it's a praise song I heard at church, and I just use his name and add the, the, you know, my own lyrics. It's great. And he turns to me and goes, Dad. That's what he does. I do it to annoy him, I have to admit, because it's his church. i got to tell the truth. 
but I also do it because I just delight in this guy. Did you know God today bursts out into song over you? Yes, you. With all your struggles and all your past, Do you know that God has loved you at your worst and is committed to never leave you or forsake you? You know Romans 5, 8 to 11 says this, but God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's when he died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. And so here's the deal. God loves you. He knows everything about you. He saved you knowing everything you ever did and ever would do. And he is committed to you because he is God, eternal and powerful. And he loves you more than anybody in this world could ever love you. And that should encourage us. And that brings me to the first point, which is God is the encourager. He, he's the encourager. Now, the word uh, parakaleo, which is translated comfort, is also translated uh, to encourage. In fact, Jesus, in John chapter 14, just before he's betrayed and goes to the cross, he, and the disciples are so devastated that Jesus says he's going to go away. And then Jesus says, but I'm not going to leave you alone. And then in verse 26 of John 14, he says, but the helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. So Jesus says, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. And, and the term there, but the helper, did you know what that word is? It's parakaleo. It means it, he, he's the encourager. Did you know that the very nature of God is to encourage you, to support you, to come alongside of you, to remind you of how much he values you? To, I mean, that is the name of God. This is who God is. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. It's right there again, comfort or encouragement. Who comforts us in all our tribulations. He doesn't promise that you'll never have tribulation, but he does promise that whatever you go through, he's going to encourage you and comfort you and come alongside of you and strengthen you. But he, he comforts us in all of our tribulations that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which ourselves we ourselves are comforted by God. So God says, now here's the deal. I'm going to comfort you. And you're going to be around people who are going through tough times too. I want you to recycle what I've done for you and pour it into their lives. Don't just hold it. Don't just keep it. I want it to go from me to you and then out to the people around you. You can make an incredible difference in the lives of people if you are an encourager. If you remember to encourage. When I was in elementary school, the scariest teacher we, teacher we had in our elementary school, her name was Mrs. DeWitt. If you've been around, you've heard me tell this story. I only have one life, so it has to be recycled. Uh, Mrs. DeWitt had left Russia during some of the revolutions, and she landed in Manila somehow, and she taught music at my school. Now, Mrs. DeWitt was the scariest person we had in the elementary school. Everybody knew as a first or second grader, as you lined up to go into her class, you better not breathe out of turn, because if you did, she'd scream at you. Man, she... She was all over it. You did not ever deviate from her plan. Mrs. DeWitt was the scariest person in our school. And then my mom decided that I needed to be a cultured individual. And so she started asking around if anybody knew of someone who could teach piano. And guess who my mom discovered taught private lessons? Mrs. DeWitt. And she comes to me and says, hey, Eddie, we've, we've scheduled a private piano lesson for you with Mrs. DeWitt at her house. So we go to her house. Mrs. DeWitt, she comes gruffly to the front door and meets my mom and I holding her poodle. And she says, all right, 
the first person you greet in this house is my poodle. I forgot the poodle's name because I didn't love that poodle. I mean, the, but I greeted that poodle. I didn't want my head chopped off. I'm just a little guy. We go and sit in, in front of the piano. I give her the notebook she instructed us to bring. She has her long, sharpened pencil in hand. She writes the date on top, and she writes down the list of things we're supposed to bring and all of the rules and regulations of her, her private students. And, and then uh, she says to us, if you come back, here is what you're supposed to do. Now, I'm just here to say that Mrs. DeWitt was not the paragon of encouragement. And when you played in front of her, if you made any mistake, she forcefully and painfully would take that pencil and slap your knuckle. There was pain involved in my piano lessons. You know, I think a lot of people are afraid to come to church. They're afraid to get too close to God. Because they kind of think maybe God is a lot like Mrs. DeWitt. Now, she had some great qualities. I feel really bad. About, but I was only in the second and third grade, so I didn't really go there too much. Um, you know, God is not standing over you with a stick ready to knock you in the head. You know that God loves you? He rejoices over you with song. He sees your great potential. Whatever you've ever done wrong or ever will do, he has promised he will forgive it if you will ask. Did you know that he can transform you by the power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God? Did you know that his plan for your life is so incredible? He is the number one encourager. Did you, Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 shows the strategy of God to transform sinful human beings who need a lot of work, which is all of us in this room. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 it says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. How is God going to lead you to repentance? Which is change. It is through his goodness. Because he loves you. The closer we get to God, the more we experience his goodness, the more transformed we will be. And then he wants us to take that grace, that encouragement, and turn it over to other people. One other thing, second point is this. Encouragement gives hope for the future. Um, God, you, you, have you ever had someone say to you, you'll never amount to anything? Uh, you are such a lazy bum. You, you can never accomplish that. Okay, those are not statements that come from God. Because you know what God does? He speaks into our future. In fact, one of the most encouraging things about the way God works with people in the Old Testament is that he... He, he doesn't let their past failures and their circumstances define who they are. He has, he has a hope and a future for them. And one of the ways you see that is in the way that he renames people. For instance, one of the most famous ones is Abram. Abram means high father. And there was a point in Abram's life where God changes his name to Abraham, which means the father of a multitude. Abraham's an old guy. Uh, and God changes, why, when God changes his name, you know what he is declaring? Hey, listen, my plan for you, it's ongoing and we're on track. You're not Abram anymore. You are actually Abraham. You're not high father. You're the father of multitudes because this is a big God who can do the impossible, which is what he did in the life of Abraham. Sarah. Sarah means princess. And then he says Sarai. And then he changes it to Sarah, which means mother of nations. And so with this renaming is God's declaration that there is a hope and a future. What you don't think can happen in your future, God can make happen. There was one man by the name of Jacob. Jacob was born, he was a twin, he was born grasping the heel of his brother. And he kind of got this reputation of being a deceiver, a wheeler dealer you know, a negotiator. I mean, this, this, this is Jacob. Jacob would, he, he tricked his brother out of getting, to get his, um, his, uh, his, his birth, uh, birthright. He, he deceived his father to get a blessing. I mean, Jacob was the consummate wheeler dealer, kind of deceiver type guy. 
I, I remember one time when my kids were little, uh, my eldest, her, her name is Tiffany, and um, Tiffany, because she was older than everybody else, was the wheeler dealer of the kids. One day I heard her talking to her younger brother, Robert, and she, was, she had this incredible sales pitch that if he would give her all of his money, she would sell him this broken down little toy. And he did. I had to step in and make a declaration. All right, from now on, no more deals. I'm going to approve every deal. She was good. She was very good. I'm not saying she was Jacob. She was just older. Jacob was that guy. He would take advantage where he could. God meets him one day and he says, I'm going to change your name from supplanter or deceiver to Israel. And that can be roughly translated, a man who has power with God. Why? Because God always speaks into your future. Number three, you choose to encourage. You choose to encourage. Did you know being an encourager is a choice? Encouragement is not about emotion. It is not about emotion. In fact, if you are driven by your emotions, I'm afraid encourager is not going to be your reputation. Let me tell you what drives my emotions. Someone makes me really ticked, and what do I say to them? I say all kinds of not nice things. How about you? Emotions, if that's going to drive you, you are not going to be headed in the right direction. But if you will decide... Because this is what God has done, and this is what I'm supposed to do. From now on, I am going to cultivate the habit of encouraging people. Hebrews chapter 3, uh, it talks about encourage one another daily. That means every single day. So th today and tomorrow, you will have encounters with people. And people will walk away from you. And they will hear from you in that brief moment either something that's positive or negative. It will either be life-giving or it will be life-squashing. Life okay? It's up to you. Your decision. Do not be driven by your emotions. Decide today that you will develop the discipline of being an encourager. And that when you walk into the room, people will want to sit by you. Not because circumstances are great, but because they can count that from you, there will be a good word. You are a breath of fresh air. You speak life into people. You value people. You make them better. That's what God is calling us to do. And it's not just emotion. That is a discipline. That's a choice. Proverbs 18.21 Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. There was a study done at the University of Nebraska um, to try to determine what are, how is it that some families are healthy and some are not? What, what's one of the primary things that makes a family healthy or, or makes a family not healthy? Uh, Dr. John Dufresne of the, uh, of the university and part of the study writes this. He says... If, there, if I were to use one word to describe families, I would choose the word emotion. Families are about emotion. When you are focusing uh, on strong families, you're talking about positive emotional bonds with each other. Back in the days when I was a family therapist, it often felt like the hair would stand up on the back of my neck as I walked into a room full of family members who were angry at each other. The hostility seemed to give a dangerous electrical charge to the environment. Everyone would feel it almost instinctively. Likewise, when you walk into a room full of family members who have genuine appreciation and affection for each other, there also is something in the air, a warm, fuzzy, indescribable feeling that fills the family, family's world with a positive glow. People in strong families care deeply for each other and let each other know this on a regular basis. That is discipline. They feel good about each other and know how important it is to continually express these feelings. I heard this story of a man who got married and 50 years later, his wife said to him, honey, do you still love me? And he said, don't you remember at the wedding, I said I would love you till the day we died? 
If it changes, I'll let you know. If you're married, that's not a good plan, I'm going to just say. You, you, you need to constantly reassure the people around you, your loved ones. Your kids need to know you believe in them. Your kids need to know you value them. Your friends need to know that you believe in them. Your friends need to know that they are important. You know what? You can either be someone who gives a positive word that leads to life, or you can give no word or a negative word that leads to death. In this study, the University of Nebraska, they determined that the ratio of positive to negative encounters for healthy families was somewhere between 10 and 20 good things compared to one negative thing. Did you hear that ratio? Do you know what an encourager does? An encourager becomes expert at catching people doing the right thing. Do you know what our natural tendency is often? To walk out of the service and talk at lunch about the person that just didn't look right to you, didn't t treat you nicely. You know what I'm saying? There's 150 people that were just absolutely wonderful to you. And you don't walk out of here and talk about them at lunch. You talk about that one person who was negative. What if we were to all be encouragers? Positive interactions, life-giving interactions, is what encouragement is all about. Number four, encouragement is more than just words. It's not just about having the right words. It is about the right words, but it's more than that. To encourage with more than your words, you need to encourage with your life. Have a generous spirit. Be one of those people that breathe life into the people around you. There is a man in the book of Acts at the beginning of the church that played a highly influential role in the starting and propagating of the gospel to the church. Now, you probably won't recognize his name. His name was Joseph. But nobody called him Joseph. This guy was such a positive force in relationships, individually and in the church in general, that they gave him a nickname. And you'll recognize the nickname, maybe. His nickname was Barnabas, son of encouragement. Barnabas was absolutely influential and is a part of the leadership of the early church. For instance, in, the, in those days, things got really tough for believers. There was a lot of need, and there, there wasn't enough food. There wasn't enough provision for people. And so one day, Barnabas notices that there's a lack of finances, and there's a, an abundance of need. So what he does is he sells a piece of land in Jerusalem. Now, I'm just telling you, Jerusalem has always been an expensive place to buy and own land. And Barnabas, without hesitation, sells the land. And the Bible says he brings it and he lays it at the feet of the apostles. Which basically he says, I'm just giving it to you guys. You see all the needs, so you, you just give it away as you feel is necessary. And he rescued families. He rescued people that were hungry. He fed the widows and, and, the, and the children. Uh, I mean, it, it was amazing. You know what Barnabas did not realize was? His gift was pivotal in keeping the, 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 the beginning church going he had no idea that this church of jesus christ would go on to start universities all over the world to help lift people up to help them learn how to read so they could read the word of god so they could be empowered and educated because all men are important all women are important i mean do you realize that's what he did how many hospitals have been started in the name of Jesus. And who helped get this going? It was Barnabas, who with his very life, generously gave the money to keep things going. Generations later, the gift that Barnabas gave has done so much to help people, educate people, to get relief to people who are in need. I'm, I'm just going to say, 
that he got in on the ground floor. He was part of that IPO offering. He, he has, there's no way in the world he could have known how influential his gift was going to be. And then there was a guy that was persecuted in the church, and Barnabas was, knew all about him. His name was Saul. He hated the followers of Jesus so very much that he would get them. He would throw them into prison. He stood and watched over as they were killed. I mean, this guy was on a tear. And then one day, Saul, on the road to Damascus, had a vision of Jesus, an enlightenment in the depths of his soul and an encounter with Jesus. And he turns his life over to Jesus. But nobody in the Christian community would believe it. They're like, oh, that's just a ruse. He's setting us up to destroy more of us. But there was one man in Jerusalem who said, no, I'm, I'm going to go talk to him myself. Guess who it was? It was Barnabas. Barnabas sat down with Saul, with Saul now Paul. And he comes back to the rest of the disciples and he said, hey, listen, guys, he, I'm here to say, I think... I think Paul is legit. I think you need to take a chance on him. I'm going to take a chance on him. And he came into the church. And then Paul preached the gospel to the world in his generation. And he wrote much of the New Testament. One day Paul and Barnabas were traveling together, doing the work of ministry, and they had brought a guy with them by the name of Mark. It was the way they trained people. They brought some young, you know, emerging leaders with them, and Mark was with them. And, and Mark got halfway into the journey and said, man, I, don't want, I can't do this anymore. And he bails on him and goes back to Jerusalem. Now, Paul is ticked. I mean, he's really irritated with John Mark. And, and, and then the next time around, John Mark says, I, I, I want to go again. And Paul says, no way. Ain't going to happen. You bailed on us once. We're not giving you a second chance. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, says, Paul, I think we need to give this guy another chance. No way. We're not doing it. Ain't going to happen. And so Barnabas says, well, here's the deal. I am so committed to this guy and believing that there is hope and maybe a second chance that you go on ahead and go, and I'll take Mark with me. And Mark, according to scholars, is the writer of the gospel of Mark. Because Barnabas decided to take a chance on this guy, who was known as the son of encouragement, influenced the church for generations. You and me are here today because he took a chance on us. And we are called to be people who remember their encouragement. serving them. Keep praying for them. If you're a parent, you know what? Kids aren't wanna go, don't want to come home if mom and dad are always fighting and mom and dad are only criticizing them all the time. Do you know where kids want to go? They want to go to the house where people like, like each other and talk to each other and forgive each other and help each other. day will leave the service and you will give away different gifts in every encounter. And if you're intentional, you can be a life giver. And you will change many people. And you will be changed. And how do you get to be that? away from us as we were ugly and stinky and full of fault, faults and sins and even hanging on the cross one of the criminals bloody 
dying. He was an illustration of how a man's life should not be. He looks over to Jesus that day. And he says, will you remember me when you go into your kingdom? And everybody in hushed silence waited to hear what the response would be. And then Jesus answers. God who loves us.